дуже важлива. Це наше внутрішнє питання. Beginning in November of 2013, the Ukrainian government made a series of unexpected economic overtures, indicating that Ukraine would seek to improve economic relations with Russia and the Russian Customs Union. While few details about a potential Russian-Ukrainian economic package were made public, the sudden shift in economic direction provoked pro-EU demonstrations in Kiev's independent square, but dwindled down to a couple hundred protesters by the evening of November 29th. It wasn't until Yanukovych officially backed out of the EU Eastern Partnership Free Trade Agreement at the Vilnius summit, where he and five other Eastern Central European nations were targeted to agree to it, that the protests in Kiev erupted in violence. Violent protests started about two months ago after President Viktor Yanukovych refused to sign an agreement bringing Ukraine closer to Western Europe, signing deals with Russia instead. However, as spontaneous as these protests may have appeared to the rest of the world, the only thing that came as a surprise to the EU and the United States was Yanukovych's last-minute decision to break off the association agreement. Leading figures inside and outside of Ukraine, including former member of parliament Natalia Vitrenko, had been warning of the rise of right-wing neo-Nazi extremists who were being groomed by international interests for precisely this kind of occasion. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov criticized those who condemn the Ukrainian government's use of force, but do not criticize protesters for occupying state property. Why don't we condemn those who seize and hold government buildings, attack the police, torch the police, use racist and anti-Semitic and Nazi slogans? And on December 2nd, the day after the first major violence at the Euromaidan, Russian President Putin said regarding the protests, everything that is happening now is not a revolution, but a well-organized protest. And in my view, these events were not prepared for today, but for the presidential election campaign in the spring of 2015. What's happening now is just a little false start due to certain circumstances. The fact that these are preparations is obvious to all objective observers, judging from what we see on television and how well organized and trained the militant groups actually operate. So who's behind this revolutionary democratic movement? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. I think Yatz is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. I can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. Meet Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Victoria Newland, who, judging from her remarks, was not only not surprised by the attempted coup on the democratically elected Yanukovych administration, but is personally in the middle of directing it from her post at the U.S. State Department. I made it absolutely clear to him that what happened last night, what has been happening in security terms here, 
is absolutely impermissible in a European state, in a democratic state. The United States stands with you in your search for justice, for human dignity, for security, for economic health, and for the European future that you have chosen and that you deserve. But who better than Newland to do the job? It was, after all, Victoria Newland, who, prior to her role in Ukraine, was the source of the Benghazi talking points as the State Department's press secretary. Those talking points, of course, claimed that the attacks on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi were catalyzed by a YouTube video and were spontaneously inspired, rather than the handiwork of U.S.-backed and trained jihadis, many of whom are now deployed in Syria for the overthrowing of the Assad government. Moreover, Newland played a leading role in promoting the invasion and overthrow of Saddam Hussein during the Iraq War as Dick Cheney's principal deputy national security advisor from 2003 to 2005. This war was perhaps the most overt regime change operation in recent history, done at the point of a gun and direction of Tony Blair, under the pretense of democratizing the country and freeing the Iraqi people. Newland's allegiances are not with one party over another. They're not even with the United States, or to any sovereign government for that matter. Newland is more accurately described as part of an international team of shock troops running coups throughout the world under the banner of humanitarian interventions, or spontaneous democratic uprisings run against any government deemed uncooperative with the recent decade's globalization agenda. Nor is Newland's role unique. The manipulation of populist movements to overthrow sovereign governments who threaten the hegemony of imperial interests has been used for thousands of years. But to understand what is at stake in Ukraine today, let us take the more recent manufacturing of such movements, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union in 89-91. to after the Soviet Union's collapse, shell institutions like the National Endowment for Democracy, George Soros' Open Society Institute, and USAID, under the cover of humanitarian aid and promoting democracy, have been orchestrating multi-billion dollar regime change operations throughout the world, hijacking any semblance of nationalistic governments into free trade friendly and military aligned allies. In other words, not all democratic revolutions in the last 20 years have been democratic or revolutionary. Media outlets report that organizers of the protest have been following the principles laid down by this man, retired Professor Gene Sharp, in a book called From Dictatorship to Democracy. This was written in 1993, but it was based upon, um, oh, Two, at least two decades of previous research and drafting. In 1993, Boston-based and Oxford-trained Gene Sharp published From Dictatorship to Democracy, a Conceptual Framework for Liberation. This and Sharp's 1973 Politics of Nonviolent Action would become the virtual script for the back-to-back -back colored revolutions in the next decade in Serbia, Georgia, Ukraine, and Kyrgyzstan. Sharp's book outlines a standard list of techniques for political defiance, which include the display of symbolic colors, protest disrobings, symbolic lights, and paint as protest. Translated into over 40 languages, Sharp's playbooks have been highly promoted throughout the world with the help of the generous funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, the International Republican Institute, or subsidiary of NED, George Soros' Open Society Foundation, and the Ford Foundation. Since its original publication, the work has been published in 34 different languages. It was translated into Arabic. It was on the website of the Muslim Brotherhood, which surprises many people. By the late 1990s, at the same time a team of hedge funds led by George Soros was waging financial warfare against national currencies in Asia, which soon triggered the 1997-98 phase of the global financial crisis, Soros's Open Society Foundation was pumping $400 million annually into civil society programs in Eastern and Central Europe. Sergei Glazyev, an advisor to President Putin on the Russian Customs Union and on Ukraine, showed that through official State Department channels alone, 
Over the course of the last 20 years, the United States and its NATO partners have spent $5 billion issued in the form of grants to develop a community of experts in Ukraine to promote Russophobic attitudes. USAID alone, the U.S. Agency for International Development, has spent $2.6 billion on programs in Russia since 1992. So while empirically the target at the moment appears to be Ukraine, the ultimate target of Victoria Nuland, the National Endowment for Democracy, or someone like U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Susan Rice, is Russia and China, two rising economic powers who currently threaten the hegemony of the current Wall Street London global financial system. And as that system continues to disintegrate, the desperation of the Anglo-American establishment to bring Eurasia under its control has turned into a full-on NATO military expansion on either side of the Eurasian continent. They are determined to, uh, uh, hoping to break Russia and the Asian bloc hmm? because their system is now exploding. The transatlantic economy is now going to hell. It's ready to explode. It's bankrupt. The transatlantic sector going into a bail-in process, as I emphasized last night, the bail-in process means this is exploding. The bail-in process is the detonator. They can't continue. They have no chance. I mean, the only reason for the war is not some issue here or there. The issue is the system, the, Anglo, the transatlantic system, cannot continue to exist because it's gone from a bail-out system, which is a form of one kind of, of pederasty, into another form of pederasty, which is the bail-in system. The bail-in system means the implosion of the entire monetary system of the transatlantic region. Hmm? That's why the war. Because the situation of the transatlantic system is hopeless in terms of uh, economy, in terms of fi financial economy, monetary economy. Therefore, the hope is that they can crush and exploit the Eurasian system. That's the motive for the war. That's the only raison d'etre for the war. This is what is at stake now, not just over Ukraine or over Syria, but over the utter bankruptcy of the transatlantic free trade financial system that was bankrupt back in 2007 when it first needed to be bailed out. And as Lyndon LaRouche has recently emphasized, if you want to stop people like Victoria Nuland from using their post at the U.S. State Department to violate international law and by doing so pitting major superpowers against the U.S., throw Obama out of the White House. This would immediately diffuse the ability for the U.S. to become any further involved in the thermonuclear showdown that leading members of the Russian intelligentsia have picked up on and are now warning of. Americans should remember what General Marshal Zhukov, the hero of Stalingrad, told General Eisenhower after World War II. He said that if the United States and Russia would stand together through thick and thin, if we are partners, there are no other countries in the world that would dare to go to war when we forbade it. Today, Russia and the United States have no real conflict of interest. And for all that is done in the name of national security, it is far more in the United States' security interests to be in close partnership with Russia than to have Obama as president. And for this reason, he should be impeached immediately.